Hello, welcome to Google Los Angeles. And for those of you watching on uh, our talks at Google Channel, welcome. We're very pleased to welcome Jeff Potter, author of Cooking for Geeks, who will be running some experiments today that uh, will involve all of you. Uh, a little bit about Jeff. Jeff's background is computer science and art. He's working at, uh, as a software engineer, or has worked as a software engineer, and, and still you still, still are. Yep. And um, currently working for a startup, which I learned is based here in uh, West Hollywood, or in the LA area, um, even though Jeff uh, lives on the, on the East Coast. He'll, he'll tell us a bit more about uh, the connection between geeks and food, um, but I'll hand the floor over to him, and, uh, and I ask you to please welcome Jeff Potter. So thanks so much for that very kind introduction. Um, so yeah, my background's computer science, and I ended up writing this book a few years ago uh, after being at one of the foo camps, not food, but foo, as in O'Reilly. And uh, one thing led to another, and here I am, um, still geeking out over food and having a good time with it. So today I'm going to really talk about two different things. The first half of this is going to be basic, basic food models, and the second half is going to involve that tray in front of you. So when it comes to food, it's always fun to ask people what they think happens when they cook. So given a lump of cookie dough, you put it in your oven, what happens? You get fatter. <laughs> that, that is perhaps true. Uh, what else happens? Well, it changes the yeah, heat is applied to it. The molecular structure changes a little bit. Um, definitely something happens. You know, I've, I've had people say magic. Um, but there's a little bit more going on here than just, you know, cookie going into, you know, raw dough to magically baked cookie. So the thing I love about doing this particular experiment is that you can do this at home with a probe thermometer really easy. There's actually a little white line on the left there. That's a probe that I stuck into a lump of cookie dough, threw it into an oven, and just started watching what happened to the internal temperature uh, as it started to bake. And around 92 degrees Fahrenheit, this begins to happen. The edge of it begins to kind of spread out. And this also is the temperature at which butter begins to melt. So that's actually kind of insightful. You begin to think about the fact that the food is heating up and certain reactions are occurring. In this case, butter is melting. Then a little bit higher up, around 212 degrees, uh, the moisture from the butter and the egg in it begin to steam out and uh, obviously evaporate. But also certain starches in the flours begin to actually melt and change their structure as well. A little bit hotter, around 310 degrees, the outside begins to start turning light brown. Uh, any guesses as to what's happening at this temperature? Caramelization. Um, it's actually a good guess, but it's not actually what's going on here. This is the Maillard reaction, which begins around 310 degrees. Uh, the Maillard reaction is a breakdown of proteins and sugars. Basically, uh, the proteins and the sugars combine and then break down and form hundreds of compounds, some of which are brown, some of which taste really good, and some of which unfortunately cause cancer. And then uh, a little bit hotter, going on in the cookie, uh, right here, around 350, 360 degrees, this is where caramelization of sucrose begins to really noticeably occur. Now, with both of these temperatures, the rate of reactions, so it's not like the water temperature where at 212, um, without anything, going, anything else in that water, you know, it begins to boil. Uh, these reactions kind of pick up slowly over time, and the hotter it gets, the more quickly those reactions will occur. So here's a nice little visual proof of this. Um, this is just a batch of sugar cookie dough that you just bake at various different temperatures. And you can actually see there's this kind of distinct point between that 325 degree temperature and that 375 degree temperature where the outside of that cookie begins to really turn brown pretty quickly. So this is a little more complicated model than maybe you had a minute ago about cookies you know, making you fat or you know, going through molecular changes. Um, but it's, it's useful because you now know how to set your oven. You now know if you want those nice brown reactions on the outside, that your environment has to be at these temperatures and be this hot for those reactions to occur. And if you don't want those reactions, you now know you need to make sure your environment does not get that hot. So what does this have to do with three dead white guys? Um, in this case, it's Aristotle, Newton, and Einstein. And all three of these people came up with theories and models about how gravity works. Now, the original model, uh, Aristotle's, was really pretty basic. It just said things like to go to their natural resting place. Simple model, but you know, it gives you some predictive power. Then we get up to Newton and Galileo, and they came up with the set of equations that are still taught you know, in high school physics today about gravity. 
But uh, famously, those sets of equations don't work for predicting things like Mercury's orbit around the sun or for GPS calculations. You really have to get into an even more advanced model, in this case, Einstein's theory of general relativity, to get a model that's actually predictive enough to be useful for those cases. So the point here is that you get better models, you get better predictions. Now, they're also more complicated models. The second part of thinking about science, whether in the kitchen or elsewhere, is really understanding that science relies on both data and uh, theory. So you, know, you can have a bunch of equations, but without some data to actually back that up, you don't really know if those equations are particularly predictive. And on the flip side of the pile of data, uh, without any you know, equations or model to kind of explain what the general thing is happening there, it's just a pile of data. Um, this is definitely true in cooking. You know, the example I gave you with the cookie dough was empirical data gathered with the probe thermometer, um, but there are equations in food as well. This is how to tell when your meat is done cooking. I confess I don't know how to read this. I do know it's a tensor equation with four different variables, and I'm figuring there's somebody here who can explain this to me, come up afterward, let me know. Um, but for me, it really is much more about the empirical side, which kind of makes the cooking fun, because you can go into the kitchen and think about what's going on here, what's the model, what's happening, and half hour later, gather enough empirical data to kind of fit to see if it actually makes sense with what you're thinking or if you can reject your hypothesis. So I'm going to run through a couple of different models over the next 10, 15 minutes and kind of give you a simple version and then a more complicated version. So hopefully that the next time you go into your kitchen, you can th think to yourself, hey, what's going on here? How can I make this better? So in the case of meat, what happens when you cook meat? There's, there's various levels of doneness, uh, everything from rare to well done. Most people actually prefer their meat uh, medium rare, uh, although there are some cultural biases if you grew up in the Midwest and have um, older populations in the Midwest will prefer their meat more well done. But in general, people prefer the texture of medium rare meat. Um, this comes down to actually different protein structures in that meat going through different reactions at different points when you cook them. So, you know, when you think about cooking a piece of steak, in this case, it's just a steak tip that I dropped onto a really hot cast iron pan, you can see there's this gradient of doneness. In the middle of this is completely rare. And the outside, well, the outside you can actually see is kind of brown. And that lets you know that that's the Maillard reaction, the proteins in the meat and some of the sugars, breaking down and turning brown. So you know the outside of this meat actually got up above that 310, 320 degree temperature. So in that meat, when it cooks, different proteins are going to denature and change their structure, change their texture, and basically cook at various different temperatures. And there's really two proteins that seem to be responsible for this. In the case of something like steak tip, it's going to be myosin and actin. And we happen to prefer meats where one of these, uh, myosin, is actually cooked and denatured, and the actin is actually still in its native structure. And there's about uh, maybe a 10 to 20 degree window where this seems to occur. It's uh, between like 130 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit that these temperature ranges really end up being um, ideal for getting that right texture that people generally prefer. Now, if you look at other cuts of meat, um, there's another molecule, another kind of protein that comes into play uh, any guesses as to what this would be? This is collagen. It's essentially the, the equivalent of steel in concrete. It gives the, the muscle tissue structure. It's almost like, you know, reinforcement. If you think about animals like the octopus and squid, they don't really have a skeletal structure. They have a lot of collagen, and that's what gives them their structure, which also, when it comes to cooking, makes it tough. So if you think about something like calamari, where you cook it and it's tough, it's because this particular protein is in a state that, well, is technically like a rubber. And in fact, if you talk to a material scientist, they'll tell you it is a rubber. Collagen itself, when it breaks down, is kind of fascinating. It's this triple helix structure that's got lots of different bonds holding the three different um, twisted bits together. And in its native structure like this, it's um, actually pretty tender. When it begins to um, unwind, these, the cross links between the different helices are still holding it intact, and it's like a rubber at that point. And if you cook it even longer, it will then hydrolyze and completely break down into little chunks. So if you think about squid, you can either cook it really quickly or for a really long time. But if you get it somewhere in the middle, it'll be in this middle state where it's denatured but not actually hydrolyzed, and that makes it tough. So if you're cooking something like um, short ribs or a duck leg and it's tough, the secret to it is actually to cook it longer, long enough to let it break down that protein. So this is a really easy proof of this. Grab some short ribs, grab some barbecue sauce, throw it in a slow cooker, and if you come back two or three hours later, it'll be at temperature. The myosin and actin will have gone through the reactions, 
but the actual collagen, which is a much tougher mo molecule to actually go through the, the chemical uh, process of breaking down, um, will still be basically tough. So throw it in, cover it up with some sauce, come back you know, a few hours later, and you'll actually have, if you wait long enough, an amazing, really tender beef short rib. So here's a simple model, and here's the better model. The simple model is, well, follow a recipe. Cook it to 165. Um, the better model says, hey, think about what kind of meat this is. Is it high in collagen? Well, then you probably need to cook it in a cooking method that either keeps that collagen uh, native, not denatured at all, in which case, really fast cooking, high heat, or you need to cook it for a long time to break it down. And if it's a low collagen cut of meat, well, make sure you think about the myosin and the actin and the temperature ranges that you're trying to hit. Why 165? Everyone kind of has served this forever. Like, make sure your chicken and your turkey is cooked to 165. Bacteria. Kill all the bacteria. Yeah, these guys are not fun. But unfortunately, the 165 point is higher than the temperature points at which the myosin protein is denatured. So now you have this tough problem. You can either have it be literally tough because the myosin is denatured and changed the texture, or you can have it be cold enough but potentially have a problem with this. This is salmonella. Um, Bacillus cerea is actually the highest um, common pathogen that is found in food. It actually doesn't really live much above 122 degrees. But of course, you can be exposed to high temperatures for a short period of time and still manage to survive. Same thing with some of these guys. So the standard rule that's actually given in food safety stuff is something called the danger zone rule. And it says don't hold foods between 40 and 140 for more than two to four hours. It actually depends on what state you live in. The guidelines for food safety are state by state. Um, I'm not sure about California, but uh, back on the East Coast, uh, I think it's two hours where I am. So why 140 degrees if the highest temperature that you know, we know for Bacillus cereus is around 122? Um, it has a lot to do with the time at temperature, which we'll get into in a little bit. Now, you don't have to take my word for that 140 degree being OK. Um, this is actually from the Food Safety and Spectral Services Division of the USDA. They publish charts that say, hey, if you hold this piece of turkey or chicken at this temperature for this length of time, it's, sufficient, it's sufficiently pasteurized to be safe. Um, so this is really actually a fascinating thing because it means you don't have to cook your food to 165 if you hold your food at whatever temperature for long enough. So a little more of a complicated model. A simple model is, hey, cook it to 165. This is basically the instant kill temperature. At this point, you know, anything that's there is going to be dead. But if you want to get a better texture and really think about it, then you need to you know, hold it at time at temperature and properly pasteurize it. Eggs. Eggs are fascinating. Eggs are actually one of the best ways to think about food science, and I, I can geek out over them for, for quite a while. There's dozens of different proteins in eggs, and there's this really, really narrow range between 144 and 158 where eggs are cooked but not like hard-boiled overcooked. And when you throw an egg into a pot of boiling water, it's basically going to follow that blue line in, turn of it, in terms of its internal temperature. The blue line is kind of simple. There's actually some step functions where different proteins absorb heat and energy, and it kind of pauses. But work with me here. This is the general idea. You put an egg into boiling water, you know, it comes from fridge temperature and eventually reaches that, well, that too hot temperature. So what we do is we pull it out at some point. We go, hey, I'm going to hard boil or I'm going to poach this egg for five to seven minutes. You pull it out, and there's a little bit of carryover as the outside of the egg is hotter and the heat kind of penetrates in towards the center. But hopefully you hit it right and you, know, you get your perfect egg. But what would you do if you want to cook a perfect egg? You know, this is an egg cooked for two minutes, definitely not, not cooked. Three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. At six or seven minutes, you know, maybe it's a little bit runny, but around eight minutes, that looks like a pretty good egg to me. You know, I personally would go for that. You know, you might like it a little bit more well cooked, and eventually around, in this case, 11 minutes, you know, it's a sufficiently hard boiled egg. But what we're really going for is something that's in that ideal range, something that's got the right texture, where the right proteins are denatured and cooked, and the other ones above that aren't actually set yet. And there is a way to do this. And when you do this, you get an egg that actually has this amazing texture, where the white and the yolk are kind of roughly the same texture. And you can take the egg and just crack it, and it kind of falls out of the shell like that which is amazing when you're cooking brunch for like 100 people, or doing a demo for 100 people who have eggs in front of them that might be cooked this way. Um, and as I said, you get an egg where the texture is kind of amazing, where the yolk and the white are just, they're set in a way that, you know, after dozens of years of eating eggs, it's like, oh wow, a new way to cook an egg, who would have thought? 
So this is done via a technique called sous vide, which is a horrible name. Uh, it means under vacuum in French, which refers to one step when you're cooking other foods this way. Really, it's ultra precise, low temperature poaching. In this case, uh, there's actually a, um, one of these water baths set up around the corner for you guys to look, up, uh, look at afterward. All it is is a water heater that's agitating with a little agitator that keeps the water moving around and a thermostatic controller that keeps the water at a very precise temperature. So if you think about that graph where I said there was a really, really narrow range, this basically keeps the eggs, well, it keeps the water at that range. So there's commercial equipment to do this. Um, lab equipment, you know, this is $1,000 territory. I bought mine in eBay. Eh, who knows? I hope it was clean. There's com consumer stuff, um, you know, $400-ish. It matches the rest of your stainless steel appliance, and, you know, it's nice. You plug it in, it works. Um, if you're handy, a pair of wire cutters and a slow cooker. You too can, you know, MacGyver your own setup for less than 50 bucks. Um, and there, there are some amazing reasons you might want to do this. So here's a piece of meat that's been cooked this way. You see the piece on the left, which I showed you a photo of earlier, where you had that center being rare, and as you went to the outside, it got well done. And then there's a piece on the right, which is completely medium rare, center to edge. Like, it's just kind of texturally perfect, the whole thing, not this little narrow band, not the middle, the whole thing is just like perfect. You'll also notice that the outside has no browning reaction on it. So you know the outside didn't get up above that 320-ish degree temperature. There's no Maillard reaction on it, which is another clue that it's actually cooked this way. When you do cook this way, by the way, what you normally do is separate the, the two steps of internal temperature and external temperature. You would cook it sous vide, then you would take it and drop it in the pan for just a few seconds to get the outside nice and browned without cooking the inside much further. So the simple cooking model, hey, you know, cook food for a certain amount of time. But the better cooking model is, hey, think about what temperature you're trying to get to. Think about the reactions that occur at those temperatures. And then figure out how to get in an environment where the food is going to come up to that temperature or down to that temperature uh, in a controlled way that's safe. Really here, though, the key insight is that temperature is way more important than time. Time is just a proxy for temperature. So here's a handy dandy chart of almost everything I just threw at you in terms of temperatures. Um, it's kind of amazing that you know, most things happen in what's actually a relatively narrow range of temperatures. If you think about wet cooking methods, these are things like steaming, boiling, anything that really involves water. They're all things that happen, obviously, below the temperature at which water is able to, to well, turn to steam. Um, and those reactions, those cooking methods, will not get the reactions that occur at higher temperatures on this graph. So these are better models. <laughs> they are not perfect models. And the reason for this is that, in theory, you know, the model describes a perfect world. But in reality, it's got some sort of error bar on it. The better model's got a smaller error bar, but you know, it's still a model, and so take everything I've said with some small grain of salt, pardon the food pun. Um, there are exceptions to all these rules, but at the same time, all models are wrong, some models are useful. Um, having a better model at this point will helpfully, uh, hopefully help you when you go into the kitchen to actually cook something. So, I showed you this graph a minute ago. It's always fun to kind of think about, you know, the extremes. What happens if you go way, way hot? You know, of course, this is where my, my background in, you know, computer science comes out. It's like, well, what happens if we go this high? Pizza. Yeah, exactly. And actually, pizza works incredibly well because it's very, very thin. And so you don't have, you know, you don't have to wait very long for the whole thing to come to temperature. Um, this is my oven back on the East Coast. Um, I just followed somebody else's advice and clipped the lock so I can open it while I'm cleaning cycle. Uh, let me tell you that 800 degrees is substantially different than 700 degrees. I cannot put my hand into an 800 degree oven for more than like half a second maybe. 700 degrees, you can kind of, you know, pick up the casserole, whatever. Like 800 degrees is just like an impenetrable wall of hot. Um, so yeah, you can easily get your oven up to insanely hot temperatures um, and you can make amazingly delicious pizza in like 45 seconds. It's ridiculous. Um, the downside of it is your oven's really not designed for this. Um, <laughs> One of these is the original pane of glass on the double wall. The second piece of material there is actually something called Pyroceram 3. Um, it's quartz crystal. It's what they used to use on missile nose cones in the 1950s. Um, it's heat rated to a much higher temperature. My oven broke, basically. I was putting a pizza in one day and a little bit of like sauce fell off the edge of the pizza and like hit the glass and the glass basically went <laughs> and broke. 
Um, it's truly amazing what you can buy on the internet. And thank you guys for making it really easy for me to go and search for Pius Ram 3 and like get someone to custom cut it. And the irony is it was cheaper than the replacement part from the manufacturer of the oven. <laughs> what happens if you go the other direction? Ice cream, yeah. Um, negative 320 is about the temperature at which liquid nitrogen boils. Um, I will point out that when you make ice cream this way, you can make delicious ice cream that you can't make other ways because ethanol doesn't freeze at standard ice cream temperatures. If you get it cold enough, it does. And there's enough hysteresis in the system where once it sets, you can then bring it back up to temperature that's safe to eat, around, say, negative 20 Fahrenheit. Um, you know, it's kind of amazing what you can do with a little bit of, you know, ingenuity and thinking about what happens. Um, some milk, bottle of Baileys, you know, some sugar, throw some liquid nitrogen in it, you know, wait 30 seconds and um, call it a day. So, Unfortunately, I don't have any liquid nitrogen on hand today to like, you know, make you guys some of this ice cream. Just take my word for it, it's really delicious. Um, I think it's page like 349 or something. There, there are instructions in the book. Um, and you know, I'm in LA every couple of weeks, so you know, if some people wanted to get together and had some liquid nitrogen, this, this could be done. Um, it is delicious. Just make sure it's not too cold because you actually will like, freeze your mouth, um, which is not, not fun. Kind of the first half of the talk ends here. Um, this is kind of the standard, hey, here are some models about how stuff works in the kitchen. Um, simple models, simple predictions, better models, better predictions. Um, I would say the three key takeaways, if you really want to remember these three things, is temperature is more important than time. Um, think about what those temperatures are, 310 for Maillard, 350 for caramelization. Now you know how to set your oven or pick your cooking method. And then finally, don't overcook and don't undercook your meats. Um, getting the right temperature is actually really important to getting really good flavor and really good texture. So now we get to do the fun experiments that are in front of you guys. Um, and this is a bit that I have uh, not had the opportunity to do this way in the past um, because Chef Bill here has done an amazing job at actually creating these, these wonderful trays, which um, for people who are watching online, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Um, it's not even really easy to set this up because you need someone else to do it for you, otherwise you know what the experiments are. So we've got, I think, uh, four different things here. And we're gonna start with the wine one. Um, so don't actually do any of these steps until I tell you. But in the white cup um, is this nice blend of Syrah Merlot, 2011. Uh, it has no description on the back, but um, you know, it looks pretty. Um, Reserve de, I don't even, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna try to butcher French while being recorded. Um, and then the small plastic cup is a 2012 um, that's actually substantially similar. And let's see here, it says in the back, uh, do, 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 philosophy of farming, uh, farming small hillside vineyard sites and naturally and harmoniously with nature, made from 25 to 50 year old vines on the sunny and stony slopes of Languedoc, sorry. This wine captures the essence of southern France. So that's in the, the plastic cup. So the question for you is um, just to think about what you're tasting when you taste these two and which one you prefer. So go ahead, take a sip. And maybe let the first one kind of sit around your mouth for a minute and think about what you're tasting. And after you know, have had a chance to taste uh, the first one and kind of you know, make your mental notes about it, taste the second one and think about what you're tasting. Out of curiosity here, can I get a show of hands? And think about which one you prefer. Um, can I get a show of hands of people who preferred uh, the first one in the white cup? So I'm going to count these out. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And who preferred the, uh, the second one, the plastic cup? Uh, raise your hands high. Don't be shy. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So what was it? Eighteen to eleven. Okay, I, I've been horribly rude. I've tricked you all. Um, I have a few hands that are nodding. Who here couldn't make their mind up? One person. Oh, that is that is sad. So um, Chef Bill very kindly. Uh, it was my fault. He followed my instructions. I told him to take the two bottles of wine, pour them into a bucket, mix them, and then pour them back into the bottles. So the two cups are identical. So what just happened? 
besides a whole bunch of really smart Google engineers. Yeah, I fell for it. Sorry. Um, I'm an engineer too. I fell for it too the first time this was done to me. Um, you can smell the paper cup. Um, I have done this with plastic cups that are red and blue, where there's no smell difference. And then people are like, oh, but things that are in red you know, taste better. There's some, certainly something going on here. Um, probably the best explanation I have is actually something called taste adaptation. Your first taste of something influences what you taste after that. So your perception of it you know, is also you know, not just based on what you think going in based on how I read it, but the fact that you hadn't had any wine before that. So if you're thinking about sensory analysis, it's actually a lot like thinking about data analysis in any context. You have to do a proper good controlled experiment. In the case of something like this, what would normally be done is something called a triangle test, where you're given three samples where one is different and two are the same, and you're asked to pick out which one of these is different from the other two. At that point, you can do some pretty good stats. But if you're just given two samples and say, which one do you like better, it's really hard to figure out because you don't really know based even on just taste adaptation or whatever else is going on that day why you picked one over the other. You can't really describe it in any sort of quantitative way that's useful. So I find that you know, it's just kind of a fun thing to do to get people to think about what you're sensing, what you're tasting, how much of it's actually in the food, and how much of it is in your perception of the food. And there's been a whole bunch of studies that have looked at um, red wine versus white wine, or people who are um, told that you know, they're given white wine and red wine, and the red wine is actually the white wine that's been dyed red. Um, and this study actually comes up time after time, and it's, it's a fascinating one, for, not for the reason that you might think here in terms of, hey, you're being fooled that it's white wine versus red wine, but the participants are asked to describe the wine. And it turns out that what they found was that people describe white wines with different adjectives than the, they describe red wines. They actually will taste them as different, like, and I've done this. You can blindfold people and give them white wine versus red wine, and unless you're out to really trick them by really carefully picking your wines, you actually can really tell white wine versus red wine. It's not that hard. The tannins in red wine are pretty distinct. You will pick up on it. Um, but the way you describe the wines, we seem to use color as part of how we describe flavor, which is really fascinating, actually. So let's see, let's go on to the um, second one here. Uh, what should we do? Well, I guess I was talking about the eggs. Um, so we'll go ahead and do the sous vide egg. Um, you should all have a cup. And I, I promise that's the last trick, really. I won't do any more tricks. Um, and I say, I say that to everybody, and then I do it again. Um, but really, that is the last one. Um, so Chef Bill has uh, kindly cooked uh, eggs at 63 degrees Celsius for an hour, and that's what's in these guys. Uh, you saw the video earlier of me cracking an egg on a counter and then basically, you know, it falling out of the shell. So um, basically just crack it on your tray and feel free to dump it into, I'd probably dump it into the, this cup, um, but you know, you'll get a sense of what one of these eggs looks like. And there's also some garlic toast to go along with it, so should you like, it's kind of awesome sound. the sound of dozens of Google engineers cracking eggs. <laughs> so think about what you're experiencing here. I mean, you've got an egg where the yolk is almost like mayonnaise, where it's kind of pliable. You can move it around, but it holds its shape. Uh, the white itself has a couple of different layers. Eggs actually have about seven layers in them. So the outer, one of the outermost layers has more of a certain protein that doesn't set until a higher temperature, which is why the egg falls out of the shell uh, when cooked this way. Um, maybe some salt and pepper would be, you know, if you were cooking for a bunch of people. But it's kind of neat to actually experience an egg that's been done in a different way. What do you, what do you guys think? I got a thumbs up and somebody said it's great. Another thumbs up. So there are more of these eggs cooking out in a water bath out there. You guys are welcome to poke at it later and kind of take a look and you know, we'll stand around and chat about it. Then let's go on to the third experiment. Um, this is a basic kind of fun taste test. It's the sort of thing that you know, I wish someone had done with me when I was in sixth grade because it was kind of cool to do when I was you know, in my 20s. Um, you'll see that there are 10 different cups in front of you. And you also have post-it notes and a pen. The challenge is to figure out what those 10 different ingredients are. Now, I will say here, if you have any sort of allergy, um, you should opt out, just because there are potential allergens here. Um, 
But if you guys want to basically poke through them and write down your guesses for a few minutes, um, and while we're doing that, I'd be actually happy to take questions on anything so far. Um, so feel free to basically run through them. Um, the little cups aren't actually num uh, laid out exactly the same on everybody's tray. So um, I would start with the, the white cube ones. Um, there's two that are kind of white and cube, and uh, work your way kind of up a line and down a line. And when we go through them, I'll try to keep it in order, but you'll figure out if you've got them mixed up. So while you guys are tasting stuff and writing down your guesses, um, feel free to throw any questions you've got at me so far from uh, all the various uh, temperatures. And, and feel free to consult with your neighbors. I see a very puzzled look here in the front. <laughs> Which one are you looking at? That one. Oh, that's usually people's favorite. Yeah, it is. It's really good. Come, we'll, we'll come back to this. So he's referring to the one that's this kind of a powdery black stuff. He's saying it's like, you know, it's really good. I promise it's, it's completely legal. It is not dirt. At least I wouldn't characterize it as dirt. Hey, hush there. You might think that. It might not be missing anything. That's the real catch. I don't know, that's actually a question for Chef Bill. Is it the whole product? It is, OK. Yeah, no, it's, it's not missing anything. So um, it's probably been enough time. You've probably got at least a few of them written down and guessed. So let's go with the first one. Um, these are the large kind of white squares. Yeah, I'd have a hard time actually guessing that. So it, it's this one. I don't know if you can see. It's kind of the large white cubes. What, what did people guess for this one? The softer one. Radish is one person's guess? OK. Zucchini. Uh, what else do we have? Daikon. Any other guesses? Turnip. Did anybody else guess turnip? Uh, you got to raise your hands. Like, seriously, raise your hands. So we've got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Radish is not the same as turnip, unfortunately. So uh, six of you got it. Uh, it is indeed uh, turnip. It's a little more bitter than I would have thought turnip would be, but maybe it's just. OK, so let's go on to the second one. Um, this is a smaller white cube stuff. OK, jicama, jicama, and radish. What else do we have? Watercress? Daikon? Uh, it is indeed jicama. So. OK, so there's this kind of light, powdery stuff that looks like that. It's almost. Uh, Almonds, macadamia nuts, what else do we have? Walnuts, almonds. So this is a fascinating thing. I'm going to suggest that you taste this right now and get the taste in your mouth. I had the same thing happen to me with a completely different food. It was hot dogs versus ham. Um, versus ham. And at that point, what I was tasting was very clearly one, and then someone told me what it was, and as soon as he said it, like the flavor was there. It was really interesting. This is actually a hazelnut. And it's like, as soon as you hear that, it's like, yeah. There, there's a flavor there, and you can kind of taste it. It like, takes maybe two or three seconds in from when you put it in your mouth, and then suddenly like it's hazelnut. OK, um, the green one. Leaves of celery. Basil, cilantro. Who here tastes this as like ivory soap? One, two, anyone else? Three? You knew what it was. OK, so it's cilantro. And cilantro is fascinating because about 11% of the population, uh, Julia Child actually included, um, taste it like ivory soap. So the three of you that taste it like ivory soap, if you didn't know before, you now know that you really don't like cilantro. You probably already knew, I'm guessing. Um, and I got to say, this is the most green cilantro sample I've ever seen. And I actually asked Chef Bill, I was like, is that natural? I was like, yeah. He blanched it a little bit of salt water and like, did an amazing job with it. So I mean, I'd buy this. OK, then there is this uh, small little piece of, how would you describe that? This kind of looks like a little smear of. So I've got a tamarind, this one. Yeah, it's a little, you know, you can always pick it up and. Beef jerky and soft. Yeah? 
Sun dried tomatoes. Fish paste? Raspberry fruit bar. It's really sour now that I've eaten the whole thing. Um, it's tamarind paste. Just tamarind. Okay, there's one that's got a couple of like kind of cubes of this thing. Any guesses? I got one person just shaking his head. Cornmeal. Say what? Millet? Oats? It's actually polenta. So whoever guessed cornmeal was pretty close. I mean, I'd give it to you. Um, Chef Bill, can you remind me, you said something special about where the polenta for this came from. Red flint corn. OK. So you've got one that's got little seeds in it. Yep, that's caraway. Um, Chef and I were talking beforehand, like he was wondering if you should have ground them up. And I was like, nah, you know, people are, they won't necessarily know, but. It's definitely got a strong taste, no mistaking it. Then let's go for the, um, let's go for this one. Almond butter, peanut butter, cashew butter, sunflower seeds, tahini. It's sunflower seeds. Now, maybe I should have suggested you get the taste in your mouth and then tell you. But uh, yeah, isn't that amazing? It's like you don't know it beforehand. You have one taste, and then you told it, told it it is, and suddenly it becomes. OK, two more to go. This guy, kind of the purplish cherry. Did someone say banana? <laughs> Somebody's guessing current, raspberry. raspberry. Blackberry. Blackberries. It is blackberry. <coughs> <laughs> Looks like blood. Wow. Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. <laughs> I've clearly not been thinking creatively enough. Next time I'm here. <laughs> okay, the last one in these little cups. This black powder. This black powder that somebody said was really delicious. Chocolate cake? It, it is Oreo cookie. It is Oreo cookie. It's the whole cookie, cream filling and all. Cream, yep, the whole thing, whole cookie, just straight blended. Comes out like this. The amazing thing is most people, when I do this taste test, like they will leave most of the cups empty, like with, with food in them. This cup will be empty. Which is a little scary if you think about it, because it's the only thing on this list that's actually completely artificial in the sense that it's you know not something you can go out and like pick or dig up or you know it's engineered. It's engineered for you to like it, and it works, and it's delicious, um, and it's not so good for you in the in the sense of health. I mean, a little bit's fine, but I wouldn't want to eat that every day. So. Hopefully you learned something about the way that you are perceiving flavors and taste by not knowing what they are. And we didn't do any tricks here. We didn't dye anything. You know, there was no like blindfolds. You actually had a lot of visual clues about what you were experiencing. Imagine if you were blindfolded and imagine if these things were completely pureed and you didn't have anything but say just odor. And then after you smelled it, we're also given a taste of it and we're allowed to guess again. So even without, you know, even without that layer of uh, information removed, it's still, kind of fun and surprisingly difficult to figure out what it is you're eating. Two down, two to go. So let's go for this guy. There's a little cup that's got a strip of paper and a pepper, uh, peppermint candy. Um, this is a genetic test. Some of you will taste this one way. Some of you will not taste it that way. Technically, I should tell you it's a carcinogen. This is a really small dosage. It's fine. But if you really get freaked out by that, don't do it. Um, it's fine. Um, the peppermint candy is for if you need it. You will know. <laughs> so the way this works is basically you just put it on your tongue and see what happens. <laughs> Whoa, look at all the colors now. Um, what's it taste like? Bitter. Yeah. 
So if it tastes bitter to you, you probably really want the peppermint. It's not aspirin. So what's on here is a compound called phenylthiocarbamide, PTC for short. Um, a chemist by the name of Arthur Fox in the 1930s, DuPont researcher, spilled this in his lab bench, and he didn't notice. And one of his colleagues was like, whoa, what's that really bitter flavor? This is way back in the days before OSHA. Um, so Fox, like all good researchers, started you know, giving it to people and seeing what their reaction was. And what he found is that some people taste it as really bitter, which I'm guessing was you. Um, who actually tasted this as like, super bitter and like, wants to punch me right now? Uh, one, two, really, that many? Raise your hands high so I can really get a count. Like, this is for science. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve? Well, like, really bitter. Like, there's a middle ground where it's like, it's bitterish, but like, you don't hate me. <laughs> Great. And who just had it taste like, you know, wet new strip? One, two, three, four. That's actually, okay. So the general population, just on average, it's like 25% taste it as really bitter, 50% taste it as kind of moderately bitter, and 25% taste it like me, like it's a sheet of you know, newspaper or something, just tastes like nothing. Um, it turns out, I mean, phenylthylcarbamide doesn't actually exist naturally, but it's similar enough to compounds that do occur naturally that if you taste this as bitter, you're going to find things like nicotine to be more bitter, caffeine will be more bitter to you. There's a class of compounds in green vegetables called glucosalinates that will taste more, more bitter. So if you taste this as bitter, you're less likely to eat green veggies. You're like laughing here. <laughs> you had a question? Is it related to age? Is it related to age? There's a preference for bitterness that we actually develop as we get older. Younger kids actually prefer sweeter foods. There's actually some correlation with bone growth and preference for sweet stuff. So like, you know, if you've got kids and they say, I want, you know, dessert. It's like, it's science. I need it, you know? But um, no, there's nothing age-related to... This, this particular thing is called super tasting, which is kind of a misnomer. It's just one particular genetic discriminator that we know of in taste. Um, but it does mean that different people actually taste some kinds of foods in different ways. So if you think about what you cook, if you think about, you know, if it's, say, Brussels sprouts, um, we use salt to cancel out bitterness. So if you have something that tastes bitter to you, you can put salt on it. It actually like, literally masks the bitterness. If you taste something that's more bitter as somebody else, you're going to put more salt on it. So you're going to actually oversalt it to their preference. So the idea of having a salt shaker on your table is actually not so crazy. It's because some people are actually going to taste some things as more bitter than others. Let's see, the last thing we've got here, and actually I might invite Chef Bill if he's uh, up for it to come up and describe a little bit more about the watermelon stuff we've got going on here, um, if he feels like it. Uh, while he's come up here, you'll also see you've got two small cups that have pieces of um, beef, and he can actually tell us the exact cut of muscle. Um, one of these is cooked traditionally, and one of these is cooked sous vide. So this is really an opportunity for you to kind of you know, poke, chew, taste, and see what you think of the differences of the two of them. Nice. Um, yeah, so the steak we have here is terrace major, which is a muscle under the shoulder group. Hold the mic right up to Beef. Oh, I'm sorry. It's beef. Um, so the one that is a lighter pink color, we've cooked sous vide, um, 134 degrees for 24 hours. Um, then just toasted it lightly on the outside on the grill to kind of give it that grilled flavor. Um, what it should yield is a nice tender result, but uh, kind of like Jeff was talking about before, you don't get that bullseye effect. You don't get the different layers of color change. We've got one solid temperature all the way throughout. So that meat is just the same from the outside to the inside. And the only thing we've done is just grilled the outside a little bit. The flavor of both of them is, is amazing. Um, I, I'm noticing that the one that's sous vide cooked is definitely more tender. I mean, just biting into it and kind of tugging it. I mean, we could be a little more scientific and like get a you know, spring-loaded clamp and start tearing it apart, but. Yeah, you're doing a good job with the science. You know, there's the collagen factor we were talking about before as well. Um, you know, the longer we're letting that go, kind of like the short mm -hmm. ribs, it's, it gets to a point. If you taste the other one, it's gotten to a point quicker where you can eat it, like you were saying, because um, we've just done it on the grill. We brought it up to the exact same, same temperature inside, but you can see how the color's changed all the way through, and it's oxidized a little bit. It's been sitting out um, in the room. It was just a little bit pink in the center for our 134, and then it got darker on the way out because it was cooked all the way on the grill. Um, again, done enough to eat, but not necessarily as tender as something that's cooked at that optimal temperature for a long period of time. And the watermelon. Yes, and the watermelon. Um, yes, actually, yes. let's grab the pack behind you. So this was, I, we were emailing back and forth before I showed up here, kind of thinking of what are some fun things that we might be able to show you that are done, you know, tools and techniques that the pros have that are actually really difficult to do at home. And um, compressed watermelon definitely is 
I, I have not. I actually tried driving over slices of watermelon with a car. It doesn't work. You just Jeez, get like. You are hacking things up, aren't you? Well, I didn't have a, you know, <laughs> I didn't have one of your really handy you know, ultra vaxes. Well, I never even thought about that. That's a good idea. It's pressure, but it's the wrong kind. Yeah. So. So yeah, <laughs> don't suggest driving over watermelons. It doesn't work out so well. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So the darker one is the one that we've compressed like this in our vacuum sealer machine. Um, what we do then is we're drawing the oxygen out of the bag itself and away from the product. And atmospheric pressure, when we seal the bag, will compress it. Um, we've gone at 100% vacuum, so this has taken all the oxygen out. And this is what it looks like before we cut it. Um, How thick was this before? So right now it's maybe... That, that's the same thickness. Same thickness, okay. Yeah, that's the great thing. We're just drawing out the oxygen and really Crunching pressing in. around the outside. Yeah, okay. atmosphere is now pressing on it. You can feel it. We can pass it around. Yeah, we'll so pass it around for... You guys can kind of... It's kind of cool. I mean, I want one of those at home. It is. So you see it's changed the composition and the texture a bit. It's burst all the cells inside, all the oxygen is drawn out, but yet you can still handle it, you can still cut it. It's still the same shape and size. Um, some say that it gets a little bit sweeter. I don't know if that's the color perception thing. Um, I find that it does. It'll make fruit that's not quite ripe a little bit sweeter. Um, hmm. But just kind of fun. It's a technique we use around here a lot. Um, that It just really it, it draws your eye to it. The traditional one tastes delicious as well, um, but you'll notice it's got a lot more water inside. It's still got all that oxygen, so it's a very, very pale pink instead of that dark red. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I think we've gone through all the experiments that we had set up for today. Um, I'm totally happy to hang out, answer questions, um, eat lunch. Um, hopefully it's been fun for you guys just to think about you know, what's going on in food from a little bit of a science point of view and then think about the perception of food. Um, and thank you for having me here. So with that, questions and whatever else. Um, how did you go about like, learning all of these things? Because I'm guessing you didn't know all these things uh, at the beginning, so you decided that you, were, you became interested in, in food and kind of different models, and how did you go about discovering all of this stuff? I mean, I, I like to cook, and like I've never seen any of like I mean some of this stuff like I've, I've heard of before, but there's not it doesn't seem like there's a wealth of information out there about this. I have a one word answer and it's really funny. Google. Google. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know a lot of it comes down to sitting down and trying to understand what's going on. Um, it might be something as simple and actually I tweeted out a, a photo that someone else took earlier this week. They had made eight different chocolate chip cookies, right? eggs and chocolate chip cookies. They're just like, they're easy things to talk about. Um, they had made batches of cookies like with too much flour or like too much brown sugar versus white sugar, and like they just had a visual chart of like what happens if you make cookies with too much of any particular variables thrown off. And like you just look at it; it's a visual proof, and you look and go, "Oh right, my cookie matches that one. I now know I'm doing that bit wrong." Um, it's a thousand little details like that. You, you kind of try to pick up and start understanding what's going on. Um, for me, you know, my background's computer science. It's not food science, but there's still that science curiosity in there. So I approached it with all the same questions that anybody who's not professionally trained would approach it with. So um, I don't know, chocolate. Chocolate's actually really fascinating. Chocolate's incredibly complicated, and people love chocolate. Um, there's six different polymorphs of fat in the cocoa fats in chocolate, and they melt at various temperatures. And you start like unwrapping this and trying to understand what it means to temper chocolate, and you look up stuff and you start seeing, oh, well, then this makes sense, but now I have this question. OK, I answer that question, but then I have this question. And it just kind of becomes this journey of trying to figure out how does this thing work? How does this thing called, you know, whether it's making a chocolate chip cookie or cooking a perfect steak, like each little step actually makes sense. But you really have to sit down and say, what do I think is going on here, and do some, either some research on it and try to figure out what, what other people have found, or really just go into the kitchen. I mean, a, a thermometer, a really good thermometer and a notepad will actually get you a lot of data really easily. Um, so yeah, that's, was that a question or a scratch of the head? It's a question, okay. Both. Um, and I'm going to grab one thing on my bag while you do the mic. So I recently discovered something called a miracle berry. Yes, miraculin. Yeah, and I was curious if you've used it and, like, in, at, on the kitchen. Uh, yeah, so um, there's something that's kind of uh, the name is definitely got, they had good PR, right? So calling something a miracle berry. It's like, oh, that sounds amazing. Um, there's a compound in a particular berry that uh, it's an African bush. It, the compound's called miraculin. Um, it binds to receptors on your tongue and it causes sour things to register as sweet. So if you, you know, actually just take a miracle berry and chomp down on it and get some of the juices on your tongue, they make tablets, which are actually a little bit easier to work with because you don't have to deal with, you know, shipping berries that go bad and tablets, whatever. Um, so you can then, you know, put the miraculin on your tongue, 
and then bite into a lemon, and it will taste sweet. Um, I've had friends that you know, had roast beef, and they said it tasted like honey glazed roast, roast beef, like in a sandwich. Uh, it basically is it's a, kind of a neat trick, if that makes sense. It's kind of like the cilantro tasting like ivory soap to you. Like, it's just, there are things in taste and how we perceive things that um, genetically are, uh, how to put, I don't know, kind of cool. Um, I don't know if Maracan's anything more than kind of a fun thing to do once. I mean, it's, it's neat to do. I encourage, you know, have a little miracle berry party is the kind of joke they call them. You know, go grab some foods. Um, there's actually a page in the book, I'm, I can send it to you via email, that has a bunch of ingredients that are just foods that are fun to try with. Um, it also alters a little bit of things like Tabasco sauce, for example, will taste like oddly sweet and some other fun ones. Um, keep in mind, though, that uh, it doesn't actually change the pH of whatever you're eating. So if you like just sat down and ate two whole lemons, like you're probably not going to be too happy. And, like this isn't going to change that, so don't go off and like, oh, lemon, lemon, lemon. Like it's, like, it's not going to be fun. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's a neat thing to do. So with the natural food movement, um, and kind of moving toward organicness and other things like that. Have you, going away from that, had um, like pushback from anyone, you know, using your scientific method in like a traditional industry? Is it kind of odd for people to see this kind of stuff? Um, no, I don't really think so. I mean, there's a difference between, look, science really is about building models and understanding how things work. And that's extremely important, especially important in organic farming. You have to understand how the system is working. So if you're looking at anything like, you know, take polyphase farm, you have to really understand if you're in that environment, how the ecosystem is working. And the science is fundamental and paramount for that to work. Um, you know, it is a tool. Whether you take that tool and you use it to figure out how to make a sustainable organic system, or if you take it to go and figure out how to make, you know, black powder from the sample. Um, you know, one of these things might be good for you, and one of these things might not be so good depending upon how much you eat of it. Um, but from a science point of view, no, I don't really think there's any, there's, there's really zero tension there. Um, I mean, you certainly get into dogma and beliefs about, oh, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what's really good for you. I believe this. And my response to that is, well, what's your model? Let's see the, let's see the data. Um, and if the data supports it, then hey, we've both learned something. If the data disproves it, well then I might challenge the person to think about, you know, why are they believing that? And, you know, that's, that's uh, shall we say, outside the domain of food science. Okay, um, no more questions. So thank you, Jeff, very much for coming. My pleasure, thanks.